Let's start with the next conference, Professor Aristides Marcano from Delaware State University. For me, it's a great pleasure to present you, uh, not only because he's an amazing professor, thank but, you. Thank you. but because he was also my PhD advisor. I hope you also will learn from, from him, as I did in my PhD thesis. And then, Professor Marcano, you can start. Thank you. Thank you, Humberto. Thank you very much, and, and thank you very much all the organizers. I see you are a great organizer, making this uh, school in optics a reality today. And thank you, Dr. Calvo, for inviting me and remember me, because uh, we worked a long time in Venezuela, and then we immigrated to the U.S. Now we are in the U.S. working. But we believe in science. We believe that science is not only for a country, it's for everybody. And this is what these kind of events are about. No? This, uh, I, I, I am very proud to be here today. I honor it to be here today. Just because 32 years ago, I was a student like you. I was a young scientist in Venezuela. And I met other young scientists and young students from different countries, from Africa, from Asia, from Latin America, even from Europe, even from Americans. They were there. That was quite interesting. Uh, we have eight weeks. We met uh, Dr. Salan, Abdul Salan, was a great person, great personality. We met uh, bright people, and uh, they were absolutely uh, believers that science is for everybody. Uh, you need to, uh, they also were absolutely believers that the bright, that the humanity, the future of humanity, will be bright. We will overcome all these differences that we have in the different countries. Today, I work as an American professor in the in American University, but uh, in a research professor of the Department of Chemistry. But this university is interesting because this is actually an historical black college. So in, in, the, in the US, they have a university in the past. They have that system, university for black people, university for white people. I think that's terrible. But, but, but I really enjoy being there, but the, today this is illegal. We cannot discriminate, but still we have over 76% of African Americans in our college. And the problems they have are very similar to the problems that you can encounter in any country, you know, what we call developing countries. What I remember is uh, 32 years ago, the, the world was very different, absolutely different. And I believe the world from 30 years in the future it will be your world, will be also very different. We are expecting a big growth in all, in, in particular in Africa, because Africa has a lot of resources, young people, good education system, they are developing fast. They will make a point by the end of the century. Asia will be, of course, dominant because the, amount, the number of people are living there. So there will be big changes in the world. So the world is already, you know, there is no one country dominating one, another country that is going to disappear. Absolutely, there will be only humanity. And that's what we believe it should be, science for everybody. Okay, let's talk about photothermal spectroscopy. So I think Dr. Marin here great, did a great introduction about some photothermal effects. In particular, he introduced the Laplace equation for thermal diffusivity process. And <clears throat> people actually, when they do this kind of experiments, they use, uh, 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 one frequency, they use only one wavelength. They have one laser, maybe because you have one laser in your lab, and you just work with that laser you have. That maybe is the situation, and you cannot tune, you cannot change the frequency of the laser. So you can, it's very difficult to do spectroscopy. But actually spectroscopy can be made with lamps. And one of the things in, what we, is in regular spectroscopy today, you do absorption spectroscopy, commercial spectrophotometer, they have just an arc lamp, which is an excellent device, produce a lot of light. And you can, you can just select part of this light and start doing some spectroscopy. And the spectroscopy is actually a big uh, achievement of uh, humanity, because thanks to spectroscopy, we develop quantum mechanics. 
because people yeah, will discover that atoms, they don't take any kind of light. They take some particular bands of light. And why that's happening? So it changed the way we think about mat matter, and it changed everything. OK. If you have any question about our university, uh, this university is in the state of Delaware. The uh, uh, state of Delaware is, is in a small state. It's one of the 50 states of the US. And it's that small, it's difficult to find in the map. But you just look for Washington, it's nearby. <laughs> on the state on the Atlantic coast, you will see the Delaware, uh, Delaware state uh, nearby Maryland. So everybody knows Maryland because of Baltimore and Washington, but nobody knows Delaware. Since Dover, where we work, is a nice city. It's a typical small town, American town. It's very nice, very, very safe. So I've been actually fundamentally happy there, no? I'm working. And we developed this method, so we are going to talk about that today. And it's, uh, mostly there are two things, two ideas here. It's uh, two devices we can actually create. And these devices are created by light itself. So it's absolutely, absolutely optical method. Uh, we use uh, detectors just to detect light. We do not detect temperature, thing, nothing like that. We can do that with the so-called optothermal. It means that you have a, t t a temperature detector you detect. But here we're going to develop some devices where the light detects itself. It's absolutely all optical device. One important thing about this method is there are two things. One is the thermal lens. And the other is the thermal mirror. I think Dr. Marin has introduced a little bit about the thermal mirror. Is that deformation that you have there? But some people don't look at that as a mirror. They just look at that as a, some changes in the refraction index. But actually, it's a mirror. It's just that you are doing some uh, changes in the reflectivity of your surface. And that produces some interesting signals or some interesting effects. And the thermal lens. One particular thing about this method is the sensitivity. So the sensitivity of this method overcome, just for, this, for the first years of development of photothermal effects, people understood that you can measure very small amounts of contaminants in water. You can measure with this method the absorption of water in the visible. Because when we see water, we see the water is transparent. So we don't see water as an absorbent anything. We believe it's just transparent. But we know that water, when you have a lot of water, you will see scattering. And you see that has bloom. So the blue is just the scattering of light you have. So you don't believe there is an absorption there. But with this method, we can measure. I'm going to show you that. We actually, we have the record of measuring the absorption of water in the visible using this technique. And then we are going to see, use this. Why this, we need that for? One important thing I have learned in America is that what you do should matter for people. So you don't do that for yourself. You do things to, to make some products. You do things to satisfy some needs of the society. And I think this is a good, a good approach. So that's the point is the Americans, they have good engineering programs, excellent engineering programs. Some people are developing devices. It's very dynamic, very competitive. It's very difficult to get funding. But it's very interesting at the same time. And <clears throat> we use that for characterization of materials. So right now, there is some kind of new kind of materials. You know, the everyday people are discovering. You know, graphene was the latest, this Nobel Prize material. Before that was the C60, the fluorine was other material that people invent, something that has particular properties. And, and, and graphene will be still, it's still being studied carefully. There is a lot of interesting optical properties of graphene to, to discover. And graphene is a material that launch a new kind of approach. Now you can work with two-dimensional two crystals that have a thickness of one atom. And make, this is absolutely new material, and that is making a revolution. And for that, there will be a lot of applications in doing capacitors, where the, I believe in the future that uh, capacitors will be that big, uh, that simple, that you just go to Walmart, go to the store, you buy your electricity for a month. That's what I believe is going to happen. I remember <coughs> when, <laughs> because I was advisor of uh, Umberto, that, that was a long time ago. But also a long time ago, I, I don't want to say I know, I still feel very young. <laughs> but a long time ago, I was giving a lecture about LEDs technology. 
And I told people, we're going to have LED TV televisions. At that time, we didn't have that in the 80s. And we're going to have LED screens, very big screens. So everybody started laughing. You didn't believe it that it's going to happen. And that's funny that today you have this technology right there. You just buy $200, and you get a nice LED TV. And there are, this technology is on your cell phone. Everybody has that. And saying that this is going to happen was difficult to believe at that time. But you need to see that in order to, uh, you need to just to get the education in order to see and, and prevent that that's going to happen in the future. So that's one of the reasons I really believe the future is bright, as I believe. One thing is, uh, one important thing is, okay, photothermal spectroscopy has been considered some kind of absorption spectroscopy. But absorption spectroscopy is so, uh, something that's very well known. You just measure transmission, you see, this is the, you measure how much light you have before the sample. You measure how much light you have after the sample. You take the log, you call that transmission. That depends on the wavelength. You take the logarithm of that. The chemists, they take the decimal logarithm. The physicists, they take the natural logarithm. It's the same. But uh, they define differently, and there's a big confusion. But it has a lot of applications. And they start, we have these applications anytime we, we do a blood test. We do a blood job work, a blood work. So they actually, what they do is absorption spectroscopy. And they compare for different wavelengths how much of this, of, of this vitamins we have, how much of these uh, other uh, atoms we have, whatever, and minerals we have in our blood. OK, but for the thermal spectroscopy, and I want you to convince about that, it's something different. It's, it, of course, it can be worked as an absorption technique, has been used as an absorption technique. But it's giving you something additional. So and I want you to convince that after these lectures that absorption, uh, photothermal spectroscopy is a, a spectroscopy to be developed. Because we do not have commercial devices that do photothermal spectroscopy. You just plug a button like in a spectrophotometer, and you get your spectra. You don't have that. I do that with my own hands. The spectrophotometer is handmade, is homemade. And, 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 a, a, and it's difficult to work because we do not have enough technology and, and resources to make it that automatic. But it can be done. And then I will convince you that this is absolutely a new kind of spectroscopy and can be used for characterization of materials, in particular photonic materials, materials that have applications for solar applications. In, in applica uh, they can be used for analysis of uh, blood. They can be used for analysis of tissue, human tissue. I believe you can do imaging with this. People are doing that. People are doing microscopy, photothermal microscopy, and they are ge getting a fantastic resolution. People have reported that you can actually measure one molecule with photothermal spectroscopy. Not one nanoparticle, one molecule. They have reported that you can measure that recently, about five years ago. <clears throat> what is photothermal effects? Photothermal effects is that's the general definition. That, so anything that happens when you have an interaction with light. So you have interaction with light, you have the matter, you have electromagnetic wave. They interact, they exchange energy. There are some changes in matter, there are some changes in light, so they, because they are exchanging energy. And anything that follows uh, what, after you have the absorption of that, there is a generation of heat. And one interesting thing is heat, it is generated always. Even if you have highly scattering sample, even if you have highly fluorescent sample, you still have a lot of heat there that can modify the properties of matter. <laughs> one of them is, for example, you can modify the, you have the expansion. This is the effect of the thermal expansion that you have. You can have, when you have some heat, you can change the volume of your sample. And there is a coefficient called uh, volume expansion coefficient. And defining that way, alpha t sometimes. And uh, you may have some changes in the refraction index. So you may have also changes, in directly changes in the refraction index. You may have changes in the absorption coefficient. You may have any kind of changes because of, of thermal effects. So the, these are all a generation of what we call photothermal effects in general. What are the two basic characteristics of these photothermal effects? 
First is the universality. Universality means that, but as I say, anytime you do any kind of experiment with light, you will have some heat being generated. You will have that. And sensitivity. So you can achieve uh, unprecedented sensitivity with this method. And what, at one time I had some discussion with some physicists back in, in my country, Venezuela, and they, they actually like metrology. They, do, they did uh, interferometry. They believe, you know, the people who do interferometry, they believe interferometry is the best because that was invented by Michelson, the interferometer of Michelson, and that was a very sensitive technique that allowed to, to measure the speed of, changes of the speed of light, but they discovered there is no change, and there was a big revolution, as you know, in physics because of that. And the, the resolution, the, 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 the device was so sensitive that there was no way that, that there is a change in the velocity of light. It was very sensitive. And I have a discussion that says that the interferometer, you cannot surpass interferometry. So there is some belief among physicists that interferometer is the best. You cannot surpass. And they say, listen, this photothermal method is a phase method. Interferometry is also a phase method. I'm going to talk about that. And the phase method, they have the same sensitivity. And he didn't believe it, and he, we did an experiment. We compared the two, the two methods. And we actually saw that this is the same. You have similar sensitivity to interferometry. But the simplicity of the experiment uh, plays in favor of the photothermal method. And we will see about that. But in any interaction, as you see, I took that for the internet. You have the laser ablation. Is what we have. We have a big laser. We have people do what they call laser lips, laser-induced uh, breakdown spectroscopy. Just make a plasma there of the too much with one pulse, you have a lot of energy in a very short time, and you make multiple uh, ionizations of your method, and then these ions, they recombine, they, and then they start making emitting light. You can do some spectroscopy of that. But the point in, in any kind of, in particular in this kind of interaction, is evident you generate a lot of heat. And this heat is being irradiated everywhere, into the sample, into the atmosphere, everywhere. Here is the famous Jablonski scheme, he's a uh, Russian scientist who actually invented that, Jablonski. And uh, I believe he was from Polish, but actually this discovery was Russian. <laughs> and, and actually, he, th this is a scheme, it's a quantum mechanical explanation of model of complex organic molecules with light. It's something that interests us. Organic molecules like chlorophyll, hemoglobin, or any dye, that the weather. They actually say in these molecules they have uh, some kind of electron, which is called the pi electron, which is an electron more or less free, and this electron moves in some kind of box. So this is a classical quantum mechanical problem of the electron inside the box. And that, the good thing about that is you can solve that and show the basic principle of quantum mechanics solving this problem. They can't be solved exactly with the Schrodinger equation. But he showed that this electron actually can has a spin recombine, the spin of this electron can recombine with the spin of the rest of the molecule and get the zero spin. And they get the singlet states. These are the singlet states. What? These are the singlet states. Uh, there is no laser. You get, OK. <laughs> I have no laser anyway. What you see there, S0. S1, S2, those are the singlet state of the electron. It means the states with spin zero. Those are actually electronic states, S0, S1, S2. And there's a lot of different states. Those are vibrational states because the ballet has some vibrations. Oh, great, thank you. Maybe it's more powerful. Good, <laughs> thank you. So you have this S0, so these uh, are the singlet state of the electron in that big molecule and they can be actually excited, these electrons, to another level here, S1, or even higher. We don't write more, more states, because if you put that, so the molecule breaks apart. So people say, well, they don't put S4, S5, because you, it's too much. You know? So you, you break apart the molecule. And then they have other states called triplet states. Triplet states, they are uh, with the spin one. So uh, there is a general rule, that uh, there is a forbidden rule that you cannot make transition from triplet to singlet state. But this triplet state is usually metastable. 
It means that it stays the energy there accumulated for a long time. This is a nice system, no? People discovered dye lasers at that time. <clears throat> the point is that in this, you can say, okay, you have the absorption of light, and then you have what they call relaxation, which is this wave, waving arrow that we have here. So this, it, it looks like a relaxation. We see where, where is the energy is going? So the energy is going into heat. So we have it's just heat. So we have collision with other molecules, and they just start moving faster, and they get an average temperature, which is bigger, and you have some heating. So here you have heat being generated. Here you have some heat being generated. And then you have some relaxation from these singlet states into triplet state. Also, you have some waves there. It means that they call that intersystem crossing. And you see there's a difference of energy where the energy is going, into heat, into heat. You may have also trans transition directly from S1 without doing anything that heat. You can generate fluorescence, so they go, or you can generate heat as well. So in all these transitions, anytime there's a transition, there is a certain amount of energy generated as heat. It means uh, this is nothing else but the second principle of thermodynamics. You know? Because we see heat is just energy that you know, is decomposed. We say it's decomposed, it's degraded. We say that it's the second principle of the thermodynamic of the system. Why I did this small calculation? So you can do it, it's a good exercise. So imagine that you have, today you have this device called the nanodrop, that you have this device that can measure a micro, micro uh, liter, or a drop of a micro liter. So imagine that you have one micro liter of water, and you have one atom that is absorbing this light. So it's absorbing this photon, and you see the point is that this atom this, all these processes of relaxation inside the molecule, they are very fast. They happen in, this, in, in picoseconds, femtoseconds, sometimes even faster, but uh, it could be even maybe the, the, the long, longest uh, time maybe is about uh, tens of nanoseconds, something like that. But this is very fast. And the point is that if you have that light being irradiated, so the, the electron, the, the atom will take the energy from one photon, relax, give the energy to the surrounding molecules, then he's ready to take another photon. He's ready to take another photon, and he can do that multiple times. So far, you have the photons there, so you have continuous illumination of that. And then you will start heating your sample. And I make just a simple calculation. You have that, uh, the, the time it takes the atoms to release the energy to the surrounding water molecules is about 10 to minus 10, 10 to minus 13 seconds. It's very small time. And you have, then you have, what happens with the heat? It stays there, but there is some diffusivity. So you have some diffusivity. Diffusivity is the normal reaction of matter just to get the equilibrium in the, of temperature in the system. Because of the Fourier law, we have that trying to get in equilibrium, eliminate the gradient of temperature. And this diffusivity takes too long. It takes too long to, the, to, to happen. It could be in between milliseconds, even seconds. Sometimes I, I do experiments so the diffusivity takes over 10 seconds. It's a long time. So imagine how many photons this only atom can absorb. So it can absorb 10 to 8 to 10 to 13 photons, one atom. And when I calculate how much this is going to be in terms of increasing of temperature of that microliter, it's about 10 to minus 3 which actually could measure with the current technology of term, term temperature. We're talking about one atom. No? One atom, you know, you can imagine how many atoms we have in one microliter. I will see the, do the math. You see this immense number of atoms of, of molecules of water you have in that microliter of water. <clears throat> there is another fact about sensitivity. So if the good thing about thermal effects, they're accumulative. They accumulate over time. So you are Sending the energy all the time, you are heating your sample. Uh, you can, of course, if you wait long enough, the sample will start boiling. You can heat it, you can do the same thing you do in your cooking. Huh? You're just heating that, but now you're heating with an expensive heating with the laser. No? You, don't, you don't need to do that anyway. <laughs> but, but anyway, you have other facts that sometimes the, the ther photothermal effects, they are of phase or related to the changes of the refraction index. And you can actually write the phase here. So in the, fa in the phase of the wave will be just 2 pi, the length of propagation divided over the lambda. Lambda is the wavelength of the light. 
and then it multiplies by the the, this, this factor, which is very small, but it's still okay. Why? Because L over lambda could be very big, could be one million. Because lambda, you have 500 nanometers, and L could, could be one centimeter. And then you get actually a big number to it as well. So these two factors make this technique very sensitive. So from the first years of discovery of the thermal effects, you know, actually, thermal effects was discovered by accident. If you know, maybe you, you hear about that. I don't know if somebody say that. It's about the people who were working in the 60s. They were trying to make short pulses, and they used dyes to make a passive motor locking, make passive motor locking in the laser. And these dyes, they observed something very strange. They observed that there is a photothermal effect inside the dye that destroys everything. So they hate that thermal effects for a long time try to eliminate that. Here, for example, is some applications. And this is taken from the book of Bielkowski, a professor from the Utah University. And he has a good collaboration with different Latin American scientists. And he's an expert. Actually, he's an expert in photodeflection technology that was actually discussed here. And he just say that this is, you can do interferometry. No? Here, for example, you have an interferometer. Or you, it could be fabri perot interferometer, you can just imagine that you have your light going passing a lot of times. And then, of course, any time it passes, you have the thermal effects. And you can accumulate them. So you can have an L very, very large. Some people have developed this multipass system. You can have one kilometer. One kilometer over wavelength is, is immense, an immense number. People use, you do that for doing absorption measurement of water. I know in Texas there is a group doing that. But now in photothermal, you will increase a lot. I think Dr. Cabrera has been using this similar idea to improve the sensitivity of the, of, the, of the technique. I don't know if you have that here. The students will have that opportunity you know, to see this experiment in place. You have the thermal lens, so they work. What they happen in is that you have the light. And this light, you know, the light is not everywhere. It's just a beam of light. It's a Gaussian beam. So in the center, it's more intense. In the borders, in the winds, the winds is less intense. So you have some kind of distribution of intensity. And that produces a distribution of temperature. This distribution of temperature is some kind of thermal photograph of the laser. And that, of course, changes the refraction index. That produces a lens. In liquids, this lens is usually negative. So you have why? Because in liquids, you reduce the density. You, have, uh, you reduce the refraction index. You're reducing the density. That makes. Uh, uh, what they call a local defocusing lens. And then you have some spreading of that. So sometimes it's very impressive. You have an argon laser, happen to have a big laser, and uh, you put in any absorbent liquid, you will see a big, what they call the thermal blooming. It's like the light is, is making an explosion of that. You have and also multiple fringes there. It's a beautiful experiment that you have something like that. People study that for a long time. And then you have this other photo deflection. Spectroscopy was explained here for Professor Marine. Other, you have diffraction. You can create diffraction gratings in the system with two lights. You make thermal gratings, and these thermal gratings actually re re produce re diffraction of light. It can be used that. It's some kind of third order effect. It's a typical nonlinear effect. So you see in this excellent book by Balkovsky, you can read. Uh, this book was published almost 20 years ago. 20 years ago. It's a still okay, very actual book. I like this book. This is the thermal lens. It looks funny. But this represents a lens. <laughs> Please believe it's, a, it's not a lens. It's just you are focusing a beam of light, a supposed Gaussian beam. And you know that in the center, you have the maximum intensity. And of course, here you have in the center of the beam, you have maximum intensity. But then to the whims, is the intensity goes to zero. And of course, it will produce more changes of the density, more, uh, small, uh, more changes of the refraction index, with reduction of the refraction index. And then you have there, far away from the center, you will have nothing. And then you create your defocusing lens in your system. That's the thermal lens. What happens is the light will feel it, that change. And because it's a phase change over the propagation, and the, when you do the diffraction problem, far away from the center, you will see changes in the. So this phase changes in, in one point becomes very high amplitude changes at the, long, at the far field, what they call the far field. That's a typical optics problem that they have. We're going to talk about that. And this is the mirror. People do that. A mirror is, the good thing is the, 
Some materials are not transparent, so you cannot pass, you cannot pass the light through them like metals. No, you cannot pass light because the absorption is too big. And you know the metals, they, can, they do not allow the electromagnetic field to go inside. But they get a little bit. No? They get a little bit there within one wavelength. So you need to have a foil a layer of one wavelength to, to measure in transmission. Uh, that's very difficult. And, uh, but usually, you can do some interesting experiment. What they call, you just send your pump laser. And then you produce some deformation of the surface. The surface will be uh, distorted. And this distortion will produce uh, some phase difference between the light being reflected from here and the light being reflected from here. And then you can collect then this phase difference. You, do, you need to do the integration. It's mathematically speaking, it's not an easy problem, but a lot of people have to thought about that. Actually, this problem has been solved, basically, with some approximations. And you can actually uh, discover a th signal over that. In, my in the method we developed, actually, over the years, we used two beams. We use a probe beam because it's a lot more convenient, and we're going to talk about that. So this is the probe laser that tests that pump beam. And we can actually are monitoring what is happening to this probe light. This is the thermal mirror effects. I'm going to talk about that. Now let's talk first about, because we're talking about principles, let's talk first about thermal lens, uh, the photothermal lens. So they, it is actually you can has a first approximation. That's a first approximation. You can consider that what I do you doing is because you create a phase in this plate. This is a phase plate. So you have initially this field. You just stamp it, that plate over that, because you are filtering. And it's a phase filter. You just add it, that function. This is the phase right here, which is depend on the temperature. And then this beam has been modified, because the phase is different now. This phase is because we, we say this 2 pi lambda over L changes of the refraction index. And in this uh, changes of the refraction index can be due to temperature. So we have that uh, property. This number is about 10 to minus 4 centimeters, uh, 10 to minus 4 uh, Kelvin degrees, degrees Kelvin, uh, minus, uh, minus 1, this, this gradient. It's a very small number for all samples, but it's still big enough to do the experiment. Uh, we will see that. We are going to people to develop the theory for that. If you want to see the people have been working for over 40 years on this thermal lens effect, and they have now they are making a lot of um, uh, applications. And you know what is the difference? The difference is because in the past, in the 70s, when I was a student, all lasers were homemade. You need to build your own laser. Or the lasers that were commercial, they cost half a million dollars. So you need to be a rich scientist to get a laser. No? Or you usually, you build your own laser at that time. Today, they are commercial lasers. But it has been a revolution in lasers. So now you can buy an excellent laser to do this experiment with, for $300. So you are interested in doing these experiments in your home in any conditions. That's the, probably one of the cheapest nonlinear optical experiments you can do. No, because you can buy a small laser which has about maybe 100 milliwatts is good enough. And uh, I know I can give you data about some Chinese company that produce this, uh, these lasers, and then I have very good relation with them. And they are very competitive, because if you go to the big guys, they, they want to charge you 10,000. There is no point. You know, you're crazy. You know? It's too much money for that. If you want to do an application, you need to make it affordable. You need to think about people. So it's not about just only science. You need to make a real product. No? That's the good approach that I learned from in America. You need to make it a real access to the product. And yes, you need to make it accessible, so low price. Low price is very important. That's the Gaussian beam. That's it's a problem. You know, the Gaussian beam, everybody believes Gaussian beams are what is happening? Actually, it's just an approximation. It's this, the second approximation after considering that just being is just a line. You see the geometrical optics. So after geometrical optics, the second approximation is to consider that this is a Gaussian beam, but this is still an approximation. So actually, the real beams are quasi Gaussian. So you have a good laser. So they have this m m factor m two factor. You have an m two factor close to one. This is. This is very good laser. 
but usually uh, some lasers, they have a factor of 10. That's bad laser, <laughs> M2, in two factors. This is something that you study optics, people can explain you this, uh, the pinning of this M2 factor. But this is the Gaussian beam, this is the properties of the Gaussian beam. They're basically two properties. It's just the waste in the center. It's the smallest amount you can focus that. And it's because of diffraction, you cannot focus more than that. It's related, related to the same concept in quantum mechanics. That's the principle of uncertainty, that you can actually measure position and velocity at the same time with, high, with top precision. You cannot do that. Here happens the same thing. You cannot focus the beam completely. And there is a limit. Now, this is A0. And there is a second parameter called the Raleigh parameter. It means this distance where the di diameter becomes about 40% larger. Square, square root of two larger. And that is the Raleigh parameter. And of course, you can, this uh, AZ with, with the radius of the beam changes with the position. So you want to do a Z scan experiment. You are having your sample, and you are moving your sample here. It's not the same intensity that moving the sample here. Because here you have is more focus, here it's less focus. So you have the same amount of power in, on chill in smaller or bigger area and you will have more intensity in the center. And of course, the thermal effects will be very big here. Thermal effects should be smaller here because you have more gradients. You will see that thermal effects depend on the gradient of the temperature. This is the equation. It's uh, impressive when you see that the first time. I don't know you have studied that Gaussian beams, but there is a theory very well developed. I think uh, there are a, a very nice book of optics by actually an Italian author, Piedrotti, Piedrotti, uh, uh, living in America. It's an Italian living in America. Have an excellent book called Introduction to Optics. Has a good explanation of this. Has a, something for a typical general course on optics. And it has, this is the amplitude of the electrical field of the Gaussian beam. It has an amplitude in the center. Has the radius here that changes with position. This is the radius that changes with position. This is the equation for that. And this is the and the, the, here you have this radium that what produce this Gaussian behavior of the intensity. And this is a phase that we have. This is a constant phase. And this is a phase that depends on the position. And this phase depends on the position, the transversal coordinate there that we have. And there is other parameter called the radius of curvature. This radius of curvature. If you are at the waist, the radius of curvature is infinite because this is like having a sphere. Uh, with the center in the, in the infinite. And then it changes signs. Huh? You have the radius of curvature. When you have z, will be the position of your, the position of, your, of the, the, the horizontal position. You have this z will be this, z here. This is zero here, this negative z, this positive z. This is more or less the theory of Gaussian beams. Something I recommend you, you want to do optics. You want to uh, check that theory carefully. Try to understand everything, the Gaussian beam, and make a plot. Just if you have any program, make a plot of that and have some fun having different Gaussian beams and see how they behave and why this is. Because some people, they have trouble understanding the Raleigh parameter. They don't, they don't understand that. Now it's very clear. When you do the experiment, you do the calculation, it's very, see, simple, very easy to learn about that. Here you have, you take the square of that. You take the square of this. Of course, all the phase terms, they disappear. So they, they don't matter for intensity. And you have, this is the intensity of the beam. We have uh, um, normalized that over the total power. This is the power P0, it's the power you measure. When you put the beam on the detector, you measure the power, it gives you milliwatts, watts, whatever you have. So there are different kind of detectors. There are calibrated detectors, and they are not that expensive, so you can buy actually. And forget about this detail, how to calibrate the detector, you don't have a good detector. But anyway. Uh, as you can see, this function has what they call an axial symmetry. Axial symmetry has, there's no dependence on the rotation of the axial angle. But of course, this is an approximation. So if you want to do some theory, you will see that actually the beams are a little bit more complex. There is some dependence on the axial, and people have made interesting discoveries about that. But in our theory, we are not going to consider these details because they will modify. We are going to consider that we have this axial symmetry. But again, I want you to see it at that as an approximation. 
of reality. And of course, we can solve the Laplace equation. The Laplace equation is that equation that Dr. Marin was talking about. This is the Laplace equation. Here we have the it's a differential equation, partial differential equation, which is uh, here you have the derivative in time. Here you have the spatial derivative. This is the, the Nabla square, which is the Laplacian. No? It's the, it it changes the, the double derivative in space. And it has the diffusivity coefficient that I think Dr. Marin explained a little bit about this equation. But this is a basic equation. It was actually discovered 200 years ago, developed. And people have been solving since when, since then. And just lately, people have started solving this equation by hand. But today, they are excellent programs. People, they have, the, I don't know, you have heard about console program. I don't want, I don't work for console. Don't think about that. I just, uh, it's a good program. It solves this equation in a variety of situations. So they have the solution for this equation in a variety of situations. But solving this equation requires knowledge of mathematics. So you need to know how to solve a differential partial differential equation, how to solve that. And there's some basic principles. If you just have a course on basic methods of mathematical physics, you should cover it. This is one of the most important equations. Besides the equation of the wave, this is one of the most important equations you should learn how to solve. Here you have this part, which is the, in, the part created by the absorption of light. This is the absorption right here. You are absorbing that light, and now we are considering that all this light is being transformed into heat. We are heating the sample. This is our source of heating, and this is the power we just discovered, the Gaussian power. And here you have the capacitance, the heat capacitance of the sample and the density of the sample. That's the typical equation. And people have tried to solve this equation, I think. This is the cylindrical coordinates. I don't know if you don't, just for you to remind. But it becomes some, a little bit complex problem in mathematics, but we are not going to discuss that here. But I think you can see if you want to teach that, it, it takes at least one lecture to, to explain how to solve this. But this is the Laplacian, uh, the Laplacian or the Nabla square in cylindrical coordinates with axial symmetry. So you can actually pr plug this into that equation before and, and try to solve that using partial differential method. And here is the general solution of this kind of equations for the, temp the difference of temperature that they have here. It's a function of position, transversal position. It's a function of time. Here we have eliminated the, the we're considering that in Z, in propagation along the same, we have the same thing. So we, have, we call that the thin length approximation. So there is no changes in the profile of the beam inside the sample. So inside the sample, the beam still remains with the same radius, more or less. It's also an approximation. And then you have this, the so-called, the, the, people that hate them, the green functions, the green function. So this is the green function, they say. This is a modified Bessel function. So you need to have that culture no, of uh, mathematical physics to know what is the modified modify Bessel function. So you can actually Google a little bit what is the modified. You will see how the plot. But today's computers, you can just put that function i0x and you get the function. You get the function. It's beautiful. It's like a sinus and cosine. We don't remember all the, the numbers of sinus and cosine. The same thing. So today's computer, they provide this function immediately without any trouble. It has this coefficient right here that provides how the evolution of heat in the sample is happening. And here you have, here I just given you this trick. But when people are using the papers, they don't say about that. Uh, giving you this, this trick, they use this equation, which is the table integral, to solve that. This is a table integral. It has to solve one integration. So we have two integrations here by zero to infinite in the coordinate space coordinate. We're having this integration. Then we have the integration over time, the tau here. And we get the, this equation is just a trick, a mathematical trick. For some, uh, there are some uh, tables of integrals, so you can actually find. If you cannot find, you just Google tables of integrals, and then it pops up. We didn't have that technology 30 years ago, and that was impossible to have that. Right? But anyway, and we can just forget, just, an equ just, just a function. Imagine that it's like a sinus, and don't think too much about the complexity of the mathematics behind. And then you have, you can obtain the solution. And it doesn't look, uh, it doesn't look also very nice. That is the typical elliptical function. 
It's also a very well studied function. There are uh, people have also make it tables of these functions, but I, you can calculate with a simple program. I use that MATCAT. You know, it's a, a very simple program, MATCAT or, the, or, uh, or MATLAB. You can use any kind of mathematical problem to solve this equation, and it's easy to calculate. It's very well-behaved integral, so it's not a crazy integral. And you have, this is the solution I found, I calculate myself. Changes in temperature, when you have water, you're using 30 milliwatts of green light. This is the jack laser, double harmonic of the jack laser. You have water, and you have 30 milliwatts, and you create the thermal length. You create the temperature, the changes in the temperature. Here, start at the beginning. This is normalized over the size of the beam. It's because the size of the beam is normalized. If you have, at the beginning, very short time, I talk, you're looking at this, is 100 milliseconds, it's not that short, no? It's a lot of time, 100 milliseconds, and you see it still very resembles, resembles the, uh, the, the beam, the Gaussian beam. So it's like a photograph of the beam. And then you have the spreading of that, it's growing, and it's growing because there is absorption, so you're heating, you're increasing the temperature there. But then you have the diffusivity, it's spreading this signal. It will continue to grow until boiling, but the shape doesn't change. So there is some time, there is some time when the change becomes stable. It doesn't change, it just grows in, in amplitude. And this seems that the, because the signal we are going to detect is proportional to the gradient, so the signal gets stationary value. So it doesn't change any longer after, after some while. But you see, after a while, I'm talking about seconds. No? It means that's the typical thermal effects. I just use the thermal diffusivity for water and the lasers we have. Laser, you can see 30 milliwatts. It's something really no big. The refraction index, also, you can actually people have. How do changes the refraction index? Actually, people say about that. They forget that this is also an approximation. You need to do that, you the Taylor expansion of this. You're going, going. But this is because this is 10 to minus 4. 10 to minus 4. And this is 10 to minus 8. So you just forget about that. You just eliminate. But. Water has an important term there. It's interesting that water behaves a little bit strange because water is an important uh, matter, an uh, important sample, and it has some contribution for this term. Right there. It makes the calculation extremely difficult. You cannot do that and because we want to make it simple, so we just keep only this term, and that's it. And forget, it's just, again, an approximation we're doing which is also important to remember because maybe some other effects can happen. In particular, if you're working with water. And that's, that's the value for ethanol, I think. The value for ethanol is very well known. And that's multiplying. I don't know what the plus is multiplying. Here, okay, here you have your thermal lens. You're creating that. You create that delta F, this delta 5. Delta 5 is proportional to the temperature we just calculated. And we can actually measure the change of the phase. In, in general, you can say, okay, we, have, we can have changes because of the refraction index or because of the length, because of the changes of the volume. We can have changes because of that. And these two factors in particular, you're working with solids, they are important. If you are working with liquids, this, this part is not that important. And if you are working with the in the mirror, mirror uh, scheme, the first part is not important. So it changes. The contribution of these two parts is different, depending on the sample, on depending on the experiments you are doing. But suppose we have continuous excitations. We have a laser, which is always there, and let's try to solve this problem. So we have, okay, so we define the difference of phase that you have. The difference of phase will be the but the, the value of the refraction index at some point R in the transversal coordinate, Z is the position of my sample, so this is where my sample is, and time is the time, that you, because thermal diffusivity, there is dependence on time, and this is the value of the refraction index at the center, and because there are some changes, you have a gradient there, so you will have these changes in the phase, and that changes in the phase, you can actually see taking the solution of the, of the temperature, you can see that you can write this equation this way. And of course, resembles, resembles the, the thermal lens of the cap there. 
Here, when you use two beams, you have two beams. We introduce one interesting concept here called the mode matching coefficient. This is just the relation between the radius of the probe beam and the radius of the pump beam. So we say that the two beams, they may be very similar. In this case, we say that we have a mode match. But in thermal lens, it doesn't make sense to do that. Because now you see that the thermal lens spreads very much, a lot. So you can actually take advantage of that volume, taking a probe beam larger, and make it a more intense signal, getting a better signal. And that's, uh, you get mz, which is the factor that is the square of the radius of the probe divided over the square of the radius of the pump, and you call that the mod matching coefficient. On, in all our experiments, this coefficient is over 1,000. 4,000, it's very big. In other experiments, when you do single beam, you cannot do that. You, can, you have matching coefficient of one. So it means the single beam experiment doesn't give you the best sensitivity. It's not optimal. But still, people do a lot of single beam experiments, which is OK, because the, the, the method is still sensitive. And you can calculate this phase here, which is the amplitude of that phase. It's proportional to the intensity, to the power your beam to the absorption coefficient to this parameter of the sample and the thermal conductivity that they have here. So you have to actually, you know, if you know all these parameters, you can measure all thermal conductivity or you can measure the absorption. But in this case, this is not absorption. This is the absorption that was used for heating. When you measure absorption in a transmission experiment, you can have some scattering. And that's absolutely different. You, know? you may have a sample that has very big scattering. This is the single beam experiment. It's, the good thing about that is very simple to do. The bad thing about that is not that sensitive. And it's not that easy to understand. Some people can get very, not, not very nice experiments. And then you can do just hand scan your sample around that. So you do the Z scan of that to get some picture of that. This picture is something like a Z of Zorro or something like that. But I, people say, why in the center? Why in the center you have a smaller signal when you have more intensity? You have more intensity there. It's because the fraction compensates the effect. You need to go from the positive signal to a negative signal. You need to go through zero. So whereas you have a maximal intensity, you do not have the best signal. So that doesn't mean this, the single beam experiment is designed. It's not the best design. But imagine that you do an experiment where now you use two beams. You can modify. You can use lenses right here. You can modify the Raleigh parameter of the probe and the rally parameter of the pump at your will. And you can make it in your sample. You can make the probe being a lot bigger than the pump. And see, you here you use a filter to cancel the pump. And then you are observing distortions of the beam of the probe. Right here, you just put an aperture. And then behind the aperture, you put a detector. Because you have changes in the focusing lens, the beam will be doing something like that. If you are chopping, it increases and it spreads away. And then you get changes of power going through this detector. And, and that's your signal. That's the positive signal you can actually measure. That's, but advantages of doing, having two beams, as we can see, first, you get higher sensitivity for this fact. Now you can take advantage of the beam where it's the most intense, because you have more power, more intensity. Time dependence, you can do time dependence easily. Interesting is that you can actually pulse. You can use a pulse laser nanosecond. And then after some microseconds, you see the thermal lens growing. It's impressive. You see, you see the pulse. You have this time dependent experiment. And then you see the signal growing. After the pulse, is already gone. Because the heat is there. It's just evolving. And then you see this evolution with the probing. It's a beautiful experiment. A spectroscopy. And that's what interests me. You can do spectroscopy. You have a tunable laser. You have tunable laser. You can actually do some tuning and start doing some photothermal spectroscopy. And, and that's an interesting thing. You can actually do UV spectroscopy using a visible detector. Because you are detecting the probe beam, not the pump. So if the pump, if the pump beam is UV, it doesn't matter. So you are detecting still the probe in the visible. So you do not need to have UV detectors, which is a big deal. And they're very expensive. 
infrared detectors are very expensive, some, some of them, very important. You need to cool them down sometimes because you have a lot of thermal effects there. And you can actually do infrared spectroscopy without using infrared detectors. That's an interesting approach, how do you do that? I'm thinking about submitting the proposal for that, but, but some people don't believe in that, so it's not easy not to convince people. And you can do different, you know, now you have versatility. You can start inventing, oh, I want to do the experiment this way or the other way. I change a little bit my laser, whatever. I can change the color of my lasers, whatever. You can do a lot of different experiments. And <clears throat> we have invented this map. It's called the optimized two-beam experiments or mode mismatch. What we do, we just collimate the probe. We collimate the probe using a telescope. It's a collimator or a telescope. It's funny, just a couple of lenses. No? But you buy the telescope, they charge you $1,000. I don't understand. It's a couple of lenses. <laughs> you just put two lenses and that's it. And just think about that. No? Before you spend $1,000, you think, buy a couple of lenses and that's it. That's good. That will work. <laughs> that will work. And you have your being probing collimated here, passing through the filter. And then you have the pump. The pump is being focused in the center right here. And here you have maximal intensi intensity right here. And then you will see maximal signal. Now, you don't get the Z behavior there. You can get a peak which is the result is the same, but at the same time, we discover when M is very big, this is the best way of doing the experiment. This is the best sensitivity you can get. And this is mathematically correct. I can show you why later. But we published that with that. And here you can see Cabrera there. <laughs> he was the part of his PhD, I think, at that time. Hmm? That was a good paper. And here we define our signal. OK, we define our signal as the light of probe light passing when you have the thermal lens minus the light when you do not have the thermal lens normalized. And the good thing about this definition is that it's a unit less. There is no unit. And this signal, we can actually show, is proportional to the absorption. So you measure this signal, you are measuring the thermal absorption. OK. What, what do we do? We do. You don't have a break? How many, how many minutes I have? 30? Are you tired? <laughs> wow. You don't make a, you make a break? Is that in a, OK. OK, so good. For the sex split, we will consider that, ah, that's a good approximation. It's actually invented by Brazilians. This is this day. What they do, instead of doing, this is the power you measure in the detector. So you need to integrate the intensity uh, of the light over the detector surface. But you can have very, very small detector. You need to have a very small detector and say, you don't need to calculate anything. You just put R equals 0, and that's it. You put R equals 0. You just calculate it here. You put R equals 0 in your calculation of the probe amplitude, and it works perfectly. And it's very easy to calculate that way. And it gives you a very similar result. If you, are, if you want to do very careful things, of course, you need to make that integration. And sometimes you can do it. You have enough computer power, and it's, not that, it's no big deal. And good. How the point is how to calculate this amplitude at the position of the detector. So remember, we are doing this experiment right here. So we have our this is your sample right here at position z, and then it goes into the detector. Of course, this is exaggerated. It's very close. I actually, take more than a meter to place the detector far away. And then I see what is happening in the in the center of that. Just taking r equals zero. I just taking the center. And what I do is just I need to solve a diffraction problem. And this is a typical diffraction problem when you have, you know the, what is your field in the position of the sample. This is the field in the position of the, you know this is the plane of the sample. You know that there you have a modified amplitude with a phase. You have a phase there. And then you need to calculate what is going to be the field at some distance d. And this distance is big compared to the size of the beam. And this is the so-called Fresnel approximation. You do the Fresnel approximation. It's a typical diffraction problem in the course of optics. But it's not an easy problem to, to, to solve. It's, it has some mathematical complexities there, but I'm not going to do, deal with that. It's, you can find in any book. But anyway, 
just need to believe me that <laughs> this, is the, this is the result, it has been tested. But actually, you can calculate that's the amplitude there, and you get this result. You see, it depends on this factor here. We have this constant V. This constant depends only on properties of the probe beam. So it depends on the rally uh, uh, of the position of the probe beam, depend on the rally parameter of the probe beam, and depend on the position of the, of the detector, which is D, that D right here. You can actually see that V is just a number for the experiments, when you have m very large, this v is about 20, 40, it's a number. And it's multiplied by the unit, complex unit, and then you have your phase, you just calculated there, this is your phase. And good, now you can plug this into the, into the your computer, you can do that, and then your computer start giving you the amplitudes, how this happened with the amplitude, you know, it's a complex function, you can have the phase, you can have the amplitude of that, but the detector, it can detect only the square of that, so the detector detects the square, and then after a lot of simplifications, that you can find the tails of this. This is the, the best uh, paper I, this is one of the first papers that I actually provide, I think. I, when I obtained this formula, it was a little bit different, but I like it the way he published. This way, I think he was before me. <laughs> and I just make this citation right here of uh, uh, Shane and, and Snook, some people from England, uh, this Chinese professor. In, in England, and this is the paper. You can, it's a very good paper. I recommend you to have it if you like thermal lensing. It's a paper to have, to have. And you can actually get a lot of simplifications and calculate for a small absorptions, for a small phases. You have the small, I mean, smaller than 0.1, 0 0.1, smaller than that. 0 0.2 is still okay. 0 0.3, maybe it's too big. Right? Still, for small samples, you can actually find, you can find this behave. You have the amplitude of the signal right here. You have the absorption, the power of, the, the, of your pump laser, and these phototherm parameters. And then you have these arcotangents. And you know that the arcotangents has have a maximal value. The maximal value of the arcotangents is pi. No? You can have more than that. No? Is, is limited, so it has, it's only by. And that happens when you have mode, ma mode mismatch experiment. That's the reason this is optimal. So you can optimize your experiment, making this factor bigger than anything by doing this experiment with collimated beam. And what does is surprising, nobody does the experiment that way. Besides Cabrera, now Marina, I convinced him to do it that way, some Brazilians. Nobody else. <laughs> nobody. Why? I don't know. But this is the best way, it's just math. You cannot make arcotangents bigger than pi. I just found the conditions where this arcotangents is equal pi, and it's more or less default mode mismatch situation, where you have m very big. That's simple, no? Seems to be a lot of math, but it, at the end, it's not that difficult. And here you have two, behind, besides the amplitude, here you have this parameter, which is the mode mismatch, which now we know it's a big number. And then we have this parameter, this time evolution. It's, it's called the time build up, the time build up experiment. You want details of these calculations? We did in the past. That was about 10 years ago. We published that. And in, in that paper, Joseph B. This is the, when you do mode match, I mean, the typical this kind of experiment. When you do this kind of experiment, you see this typical Z. And you see the evolution over the time. You see, you are making, this is at the beginning. And then you have more heat. You have more signal, more heat, more signal. And the shape doesn't change at some distance. So that you have actually what you see at the center, where you have maximal intensity, you have small signal, zero, because of diffraction compensation. So it, it's not the best way of doing the experiment. But if you do the mode mismatch, you can get this way. So you get uh, uh, small, then it's growing, it's growing. It's, it's like more natural. It's, it's, it's something that you understand better. You see, why you have that Z? Why is zero when you have more intensity? That confuses. No? That confuses a lot of people, the why you have zero when you have the maximal intensity, where you should have the maximal signal if you have maximal intensity. And here you have, you have that. When you do mode mismatch, you have the maximal intensity where you have maximal signal. And this is calculations made with using MATCAT, very simple program, and that formula I just showed before. And this is an, a real experiment. A real experiment, we just have our pumping here. Being focused, we measure point by point. That's very difficult to do. It's a lot of work, 
doing that, we may point by point, we measure the, the radius of the beam, you know, they use the, the, that razor method invented by Boyd. I remember this, it's a very difficult method. Today they use a device, but at that time we didn't have that device to measure the, you can use a CCD camera to see the radius, you can do that today. But at that time we didn't have that. So we measure point by point here, and then we have probing. The probing was collimated. Huh? This is the collimation that you have here, the coefficient m over thousands. So they have that. And this is a real experiment for water. What's interesting is this water experiment, you see, this is the probe. What is happening with the probe beam? Your probe beam is, is a, it has a continuous light. It's continuous there. When you in, inject the pump, it starts the thermal lens being building up. It builds up, it goes to zero. It goes to some value, and it gets stationarity over five seconds. So you get the stationarity here in water, what you have there. And what is interesting is the water that was done with the, with the red light, 632. The, the probe was 632, and the 532 was the green light from the laser. And we have two millimeters cell. Two millimeters of water are giving you a big signal. But you see, it doesn't look impressive, no? And you see, it's not that impressive. But let's do the following. Let's do this. I can just, from this calculation, from this measurement, I can take my signal and say that this is T0, this is T. I take this minus T, divide over T0, and I get my signal right there. So it seems to be a little bit noisy. No? It doesn't look so impressive. But you can do the following. You can use a filter to eliminate that DC. You don't need that DC. You only need that, the DC value for calibration purposes. And then you can take that AC component, amplify. If you amplify the whole thing, the amplifier just becomes saturated because it's too much, uh, too much current. But if you amplify just a little bit, you can amplify a lot and you get a very good sensitivity. And here you have the, the, what they call for water. This signal is not theory. This is an experimental signal. It looks theoretical signal. And you see, this is the chopping uh, of the, my pump. I have been chopping, and the signal is negative. It grows up because I'm taking this AC, amplifying, and then averaging. And I do that, and it can get that sensitivity. This is, unit is the, is the noise, the signal to noise. They have signal to noise 5,000. You see? And here you have, and here you have just, uh, okay, arbitrary units, whatever. But the noise is very, very small. And then I notice when the cell was without water, I noticed it didn't have a signal. And the signal was from the cell, from the glass of the cell. But the signal was very big. I was able to measure this signal. is about 1,000 times smaller. I was still able to measure with some noise right there. And the signal has another sign, has the coincidence with the sign of the pump. It's positive. So in glass, the, the, the changes are positive, but in water, they are negative. And of course, when they are, you have glass and water, this small change doesn't affect the, 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 the water results. We're talking about two millimeters of water. That's impl impressive. I, I show this result to to Dr. Boyd, but Dr. Boyd is a professor from Rochester University, a very well uh, famous scientist in nonlinear optics. He, he told me, this is too good to be true. He didn't believe it. Okay. <laughs> publish. <laughs> At least we publish that. <laughs> this publish is okay. We publish in a, in a applied physics letter. Right? Here you have for water, it's negative. You get your Z-scan, you see perfectly. And this is the absolute value of the signal. It's very small. Or water. But we are able to see almost a perfect you know, <laughs> signal. And this is the signal from glass. You know? and it took us some while to do that, the averaging. And to do that, I average over thousands of pulses. And then I get that 10 to minus 7. It means that I can measure a signal 10 to minus 7, less than a million times smaller, a million change. These are, you can change the frequency chopping of water, start playing with that. It changes with the time. You can, do different kind of experiments, so I think I can go ahead. Here you have, what I wanted to show you here is that the signal-to-noise ratio for water is in the thousands. 
in the thousands. And we are doing that with a small laser. So you cannot do that with normal spectroscopy. If you put water, one cuvette of one centimeter spectro spectroscopic cuvette in a normal commercial spectrophotometer, you cannot measure anything but in the infrared. Only in the infrared you can get something. But you guess it's below the sensitivity of that device because it's 10 to minus 4. It's very small. Uh, you can measure there maybe 10 to minus 3. So it's still 10 times smaller than the sensitivity of the regular spectrophotometer. So you cannot do water for you is nothing. You say it doesn't have absorption. It has. Very small, but it has absorption. And you say, what do you need that for? Here there's another property I want to show you. It's an interesting property. Is that if you have scattering, you have scattering, you cannot uh, produce heat. If the light is scattered, so the light is not trapped by the matter. So it means that the scattering light is not affecting the effect. It means that for the thermal method, is scattering free. And people didn't believe in that. Let's do an experiment. I say, let's do an experiment. And here we do an experiment. We have, we, we measure the turbidity. Turbidity means that you have water and you see it's not clean and you have some particles there inside. It is turbid. Huh? And they measure the turbidity. It's just similar to absorption. You just take the, how much light is passing through. You take the logarithm of that and you call that turbidity. Huh? The noun is not absorption. It's just losses because you have something in water, some, some uh, particles that scattered light. And here you have turbidity, zero. Here to have turbidity, 8.6. I have my, this is my signal. How I increase turbidity? I have some, I think I use metal here or what? Water. I use some sample, water or some, maybe I can put some dyes just to increase this. Sense. The signal was big here. The signal was big. I put some, something additional to increase the absorption. And I have, I, I start using some microspheres, latex microspheres that increase the, uh, the scattering. If you put too many of them, that becomes like milk. When you see, when you see milk, which is white, that's actually scattering. It's not the real color of milk. What you have is scattering of light, white light, the scattering. It's mostly scattering. Yeah. We are, our, we, uh, our skin is in a scattering sample. And that's actually designed by nature, so we don't need to be heated so much by, by sun, no? Because we're going to die. We have too much temperature. And we have, we, we do not have a real, we have some absorption, but most of the light, visible light, is being scattered with uh, our skin. So what we have is just scattering of light. That's interesting because, okay, we, now we have a technique that is scattering free. Okay, now I increase the scattering 15 centimeters. This is similar to in a, in a small, small uh, of the skin. The skin has a scattering property of 20, 20, 30. It's similar. I still get the signal. Noisy because it's reduced, but the signal is still there. I can actually, okay, it means that maybe I can measure my signal through my body and start doing some imaging of that. No? Why not? My bones. I, of course, you need a little bit better technology. But anyway, I did these experiments with just microspheres and, 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 and show that there's no problem with the scattering. Here you have measure. Here we measure the, uh, the signal as a function of turbidity. You have turbidity of over 10. You start making that signal small. What is happening here? You have multiple scattering, multiple scattering, and that erases a little bit the gradient. Because now you have bigger, and the gradient becomes smaller that at the end, the turbidity can affect, of course, the thermal signal. But you still have a signal. But if you do trans transmittance, transmittance right here, you see a signal which is four order of magnitude smaller. Four order of magnitude smaller. It means that you cannot see anything through transmittance. But maybe in photothermal, you still can see something. That's an interesting idea. Can we do imaging of bonds using visible light so we don't need to use x-rays? Something for new generations to think about. Maybe we can do it. Here you have, in highly turbid samples, I just take milk as a turbid sample, and it has turbidity of 10 right here. So you see the thermal lens, thermal lens signal going down a little bit, and then suddenly it's been destroyed. No? But it, it reduces about 100 times. It's still there, smaller, but it's still there. So you can still detect in milk 
which is similar to normal uh, skin of, of people. And here, this is the real signal. You have the signal. The detector, we still have, you can see we have even passing through a good uh, turbidity, we still have. We published that also, this is the reference, you can check this paper, 2013. And just to finalize these 15 minutes, I would like to introduce this photothermal mirror effect and to talk a little bit about that. And what we have, as I say, that we have a palm beam and it creates a distortion. But this distortion is very small. It's nanometric. It's about one nanometer, maybe less than that. It's very small. But it's good enough, it's good enough to produce changes in the face, remember, not because of the lambda is very small. We still can have a good face effect because of that. And then you can start to do a similar experiment, but now in a mirror configuration. What do you need that for? When suppose most of the samples, minerals, uh, you have, if you have transparent samples, no big deal, so you can do it in, trans, uh, in trans, transmittance. But if you have metals, you cannot measure the absorption of metals, it's very difficult, no? Because metals are, they absorb everything, <laughs> they absorb everything. And minerals, mostly the, the old materials that are not transparent to light, but you still can analyze the surface of the material. You still can have the surface and make some distortions of that and get a signal. You do the same thing, you solve the same Laplace equation, similar to that, but now you need to solve this, you need to add another equation. It's called the equation of the, the thermoelastic distortion. And it's a beautiful equation for people who like math. Huh? But here you have double the gradient of the gradient uh, gradient of divergence, and then you have the nabla here. Wow! <laughs> That's quite, and, then and then people, when they do the reference to this equation, they cite a, a book, which is a book of a Polish author. It's so complex, it's so difficult to, to, to understand. I, I don't want to reduce merits, but I found a book of Landau. You know, Landau was a famous R uh, Russian physicist. Nobel Prize because of his contribution to superconductivity in the 60s. And Landau has an excellent collection of physics. Well, in the book of elasticity, about the theory of elasticity of Landau, I found this equation. It has a beautiful demonstration of that equation. Absolutely elegant, beautiful thing. It is a difficult equation. But this equation happily with computers can be solved. But we didn't count uh, with a group of Brazilians who solved this equation, found some solutions of these equations, and they actually published a lot of papers about that, and these papers are very difficult to read. They're, you need to know math very well. You need to know that. If you like math, these are the papers to read if you want to, to, to understand better this. But they use boundary conditions. One of the boundary conditions is that far away from the laser, there is no changes in temperature. And the other boundary conditions is there's no stress. This is the stress tensor. Is that's pulling this distortion, so there's no stress. The stress is just where you have, you have the beam. That's what is the meaning of these difficult concepts and sometimes people get, because it's a tensor. It's a tensor concept, so it becomes a little bit more complex there. But anyway, the idea is that it's a free space. It's a free space. And when these boundary conditions, and you define the phase difference has the, you have, Something like that, you have your beam is coming to the center and then being reflected, or it's coming from the wings, it's being reflected, but there's a difference between them. You can actually find this difference, distortion. The difference in the distortion when you have R equals zero at the beginning, and you have uh, in what R equals R far away, and you have some difference in phase. And that's similar to the thermal lens effect, but that is a mirror right now. And this is the scheme of the experiment, so you have your palm beam, and then you can create that distortion. Then you can probe. You can have a probe beam that test, can test that and modify it, doing a very similar experiment, but now in the, in the geometry of reflection. And it may have a lot of applications. And these are the references for this Brazilian group. I just wrote them. You are interested in how to solve this equation. And it's a beautiful thing. I think, I think these papers are 
something about uh, methods of mathematical physics is a good advance. Of this. It's a group of physicists in Brazil, but they collaborate with uh, other people. And, and, and Bajkowski may be somewhere in all, all this. Oh, here you have Bajkowski, collaborate with him. <laughs> he has that in one of these papers there. Really good papers. But when you, you are doing an experiment, you read these papers, oh, they don't, don't understand that. It's too, too difficult. It's, it's true. You need to you have something practical. And, and what they did, OK, I spent my time. I modified a little bit the results. And I found this solution. And this is the phase you generate. That's the, they found the equation. The way they found it, I'm not going to talk about that. But this is the phase you generate. You get that. And here there is a function, f of eta. Now, you see, this equation is beautiful because there is no unit. Everything is unitless. There is no unit, so you don't worry about the coefficients and anything. You have a time dependence, tau, which is you have this time built up. And you have this dependence, g, which is the distance divided over the size of the pump beam, the radius of the pump beam. You have this. And you have this int integration over eta right here. And any computer can take it. And I did that. You can actually calculate that with the simple math. With MathCat again, you can calculate that easily. You, you want to buy this program, I recommend. For students, it costs about $100. For commercial applications, it costs thousands. But I never, I can, we cannot pay thousands. We pay 100, it's okay. I say I am a student. They pay 100. <laughs> they don't care. And we used that solution we just published a couple of years ago. And we're still working, and we, we just finished one another work. Interesting, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. And here you have the phase amplitude. It's proportional to this 5, which is not this alpha t. This is not the absorption. This is the thermal, the, uh, thermal dis, dis, uh, elasticity, thermal elasticity, thermal elastic coefficient. You, know, you can measure that. This is the Poisson ratio. So the Poisson ratio, when you have changes in the volume, so the solids, they expand in this direction different from this direction. They expand differently. So this relation is called the Poisson. That depends on the structure of the uh, crystallographic cell. Depend of that. It's depend of the atomic properties. The way is expanding in this direction. It's not the same that expanding in this direction. This is called the Poisson ratio. This concept is interesting, but sometimes it's difficult to understand. When you see these equations there, they put this Poisson ratio. You should know that. OK. Anyway. I just put in a way you can actually understand. If you measure the amplitude, you get something proportional to the thermal quantum gel. What is the thermal quantum gel? This is the number of photons used for heating divided over the number of photons absorbed. No? You have 100 photons absorbed, maybe 80 photons were used for heating. And that's it, the energy of it. That's quantum gel. And that's what you measure in this method. That's the interesting thing. Now you're not measuring the absorption. You're measuring the thermal quantum gel, actually. Just actually, it's a new parameter. Nobody knows nothing about that. It's absolutely a new parameter for characterization of samples. But you have this time without you can build, you can measure the thermal diffusivity. But now it's a, in a thermal mirror, it's good because you can measure at some distance. You don't need to go far. You have some materials far away. You, know, you have a nuclear reactor. You want to measure the thermal diffusivity there. If you are hitting too much the reactor, you can do it. Uh, it's, re it's remote. You can do that remotely. Oh, that's interesting. And you can have, again, the amplitude of the field. Again, we use the diffraction theory right here. Uh, we use the same definition for the signal. The signal when we have the phase and we do not have the mirror. So we just chop. We cut the beam, put the beam. Cut the beam. We just chop it some of the little bit. And we do the experiment a lot of times. And that's what I get. That is the theory. That is what Matt Cat gave me. The theory, I get this theory for different, this, uh, this theta is just this phi zero, is the amplitude. And I take the, the same amplitude, but I take different uh, rally uh, parameters for the probe. And I see if you get bigger rally parameter, you get bigger signal. But the time behavior is not affected. The time behavior is not affected in the way you are actually focusing your probe. That's a good thing. No? Here you can actually estimate with the theory the signal has a function of this phase. If the phase is too big, it becomes a little bit nonlinear. You are getting the phase of one 
radian. We're talking about the radian. And if you're getting a phase of 0 0.1, still here, it's, it's, uh, it's still linear. So you can actually work. You just need to check when you do your experiment, you want to have some signal that is proportional to the quantum yield. You need to make sure the linearity of your signal. You just make sure the signal is not that big. And that's the photothermal mirror spectrophotometer. This is actually it's a new device. And what we have here, I don't know, do you have time? It's over? Five minutes, okay, let's finish that. Yes, okay, we have the pump uh, here. We just go to a reference, and then we take that pump. We focus on the beam, and after focusing, I just put a block. I put a block here, so this beam is not needed longer. You can you book another mirror, you get more effect, but you don't need it because the lasers are, have enough, enough power. And then you have the probe laser. You can, you can use the laser as it is, or you can use a collimator if you want. But the laser is already collimated. It has about one millimeter, a couple of millimeters in radius. It could be considered a collimated beam for this experiment. And then you have your beam here. It's being reflected back. Then take that reflection, and take I just increase a little bit with this lens. This, when you put this lens, it's actually it's like having a small aperture because you're just amplifying the amplitude. What they do is they amplify, and you amplify that, and you get your you see, detect your signal. Here you got, and here you have some results of your experiment. And what you have, this is the result for a glass filter. You have this black glass filter that has a lot of absorption, and you get the reflection. You get a very big signal. This is, signal has been normalized. To the, max, to the stationary value. The stationary value of value was somewhere here. So it's going to, it go, grows very fast and then goes into a stationary value. And the red light is the theory, is the model. So you can actually, but in here you have the time in units of TC. So you actually can have, this is unit less. You, you can measure your TC, just fit your experimental data until you get a good coincidence with the theory. But this red light actually is a universal curve. It happens for any sample that follows those equations. If you find something that does not behave like graphene, I don't know, maybe it's different, maybe you have some quantum effects, but if you have a classical material that corresponds to the solution of these two equations, the thermoelastic equation, the, the Laplace equation of the diffusivity, you, they should behave that way. If they behave differently, there is something new. So you have a paper. Huh? And here you have nickel. Nickel. I just have a couple, uh, several metals there. Nickel, you got the same thing, but it's different now. You have different TC. But here's a unit of TC, and this is normalized over the stationary value. And you get, again, the same behavior. It's the same curve. So all times, the red curve is the same. But this is nickel. This is glassy carbon. Glassy carbon is, is a carbon which is polished. And it's used because it has a good, uh, it's used in, in electrochemistry because it has, for, has a, uh, anodes, because it has good electrical properties, conductivity, and things like that. It's a nice device, it's a nice uh, material, actually. And I like it, it has a good signal. And you can, I did for a lot of different glasses and things like that. And then I measure here what you call the values of this uh, built up. And this is what the red light is the theory. And these are my experiments. So the experiments for different copper, platinum. It didn't behave so well, but it's still there. Nickel, titanium, quartz, glass. And then I have a collaborator from uh, Stony Brook. He gave me this material, uh, this prosium titanate. This material is, to, is used to control nuclear reactors. And it's very interesting material because it has a, a properties, a very high absorption of neutrons. So it's a, you have a nuclear reactor is going out to control. You need to put the, that, try to get back into control the, the reactor. No? And you see, you see one, two, three orders of magnitude of different. You go from glass to copper. I would like to have gold. Gold is somewhere here, but they don't have gold. No? And you can actually make a calibration curve. And then from that curve, I can calculate how much is the diffusivity of the, this prosium titanate. I have calibrated my experiment with known values of materials. And of course, it's a lot of work you need to do carefully. There is, there is no robot. The robots are my students and myself. There are no robots there. So we work a lot to get these this points. No? 
And we measure also the amplitude, the stationary value. So the stationary value, it should be proportional to the phase divided over, over the power. So you remember the phase is right here. Right here, you have divided over the power. You get something that is proportional to the quantum yield multiplied by these thermoelastic parameters right here. You have these thermoelastic parameters. So you divide this over this, and you get this last picture they have right here. So you have the line, and you have the, 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 the for different materials, from copper up to glass. And then I put this proson titanate and this proson ditatanate. And it happens to be they have differences. They have good, uh, good uh, thermal diffusivity. They are similar. But the thermoelasticity or the properties of elastic properties, they are different. And that's interesting because it's more flexible. It's the other. And that could be understood why this is happening. is because this proton de titanate is, it has more atoms. It's more compact. It's more difficult to, it's more difficult to uh, expand. And you can actually see that it, because you have more titan, you have two titaniums there, so it's five, seven oxygens in, in the cell. It's more difficult to deform that. that. That's the reason you have here this. It's almost, in, almost five, six times. It's a good number. So that was this. And we can make a conclusion. And the conclusion is that, good, photothermal lens and photothermal mirror are versatile techniques, are very sensitive, and you can use for determination of absorption and photothermal properties of material. We can make that general conclusion. And the use of pump probe configuration allows the implementation of a spectroscopy is what we're going to talk tomorrow. We're going to talk about the spectroscopy experiments we have done with these two configurations. And why, I should show tomorrow, why this spectroscopy is a new spectroscopy. It's not regular absorption spectroscopy. So I hope I convince you tomorrow about that. Thank Thanks, you. Professor Marcano, for this complete and nice lectures. And now you have time for some questions.